Um, we are starting on Acts Part 1, Lesson 3 today, and we're going to do a slight review so that we can kind of get ourselves back into context and then get going on um, what we studied this week. This week. So we want to make sure that um, we stay on track <laughs> and get through it and don't have to rush at the end like I felt like I had to do last time. Okay, and that's my fault, not yours. But with this... As we get into Acts, uh, the lesson three, where we looked at chapters three and most of, but not all of four, um, and that's what we're going to cover today. But we want to talk about briefly what happened in Acts one and Acts two um, to set us up, because Acts one and Acts two, all of these chapters, but Acts one and Acts two are some of the most crucial and pivotal to the church, to the establishment of the church, to our lives and the beginnings of these things. It's, it's almost as critical as going back to Genesis and seeing creation and the beginnings of things. Um, I don't know that there's any part of the Bible that I would say isn't critical, but in Acts chapter one, we have after the resurrection of Jesus, we have the uh, apostles, the 11, that are still with Jesus and some of his followers and there's a period of time between the resurrection and Jesus' ascension, which is also in Acts 1, of 40 days. And that 40 days started with, again, the day of his resurrection. And then um, 50 days later, we have the first event of chapter 2, which is Pentecost. But in chapter 1, we have them with him. What are some of the things that Jesus is teaching in those 40 days? There are basically two main categories. Do you remember? The kingdom. Teach them about the kingdom of God. Yes. The spirit, the, he was going to send them a, that the Holy Spirit was coming. Right. And that was a promise that he was making, but a promise that God had made long ago. This promised Holy Spirit. This is also something that Jesus spoke about throughout his ministry. Also, they didn't understand it. We really still don't completely understand it, but this promise was coming. So it's, it's a promise, like in other words, something's going to happen, but it's also the promise of a person in the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, he tells them to go back to Jerusalem at the point they're on the Mount of Olives. He tells them to go back to Jerusalem, and they do, um, and they were to wait there. And they were wait to wait specifically for this promise. Um, and in, after he says these things, they watch as Jesus rises and goes up in a cloud. And then there's two that we believe are angels or men that dressed in, in white that come and basically say, why are you looking up? You know, he told you to go. <laughs> and he's coming again in the same manner. So we know when Jesus returns, he's returning in the same manner. The, and and specifically even to the Mount of Olives, but um, they so they go back. They go back to Jerusalem. One more thing, though, that Jesus tells them they are to do. They, he he talks about the kingdom of God. He tells them about the promise. He tells them that with the Holy Spirit coming, they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. But he also tells them they are to be something. They're to do something specific. Do you remember what that is? Stay in Jerusalem. They're to stay in Jerusalem, but after they get the promise of the Holy Spirit, what are they to do? Witness the gospel. Witness. Witness specifically <laughs> to what? I heard gospel, but it's the resurrection. The resurrection. And okay. and not that that gospel isn't important because that's part of the gospel, but we want to keep in mind that he specifically talked about the resurrection. So, I mean, told them about the resurrection. The last part of chapter one is Peter reminding them from the Old Testament. And um, I've got some Old Testament references that we're going to talk about, but not these because we're going to talk about the ones. But over and over throughout Acts, you've got the Old Testament. Why would they be referencing the Old Testament? That's all they had. Very good. <laughs> For one thing, it's all they had. The rest of this had not yet been written. Um, what we have as the completed Bible had not yet been written. Um, also, it was Jesus's pattern. 
Jesus used the Old Testament all the time when he was talking. It is the word of God. It was given to them. And so they're re referencing back. And I'm sure some of this has been revealed to them, um, you know, the connections. Because honestly, I'll be honest with you, sometimes when I see New Testament writings referencing something to the Old Testament, if I go back and read it, I get it now. But I would not have gotten it. Mm -hmm. if it hadn't been pointed out or if it hadn't been already fulfilled by Jesus, right? And we see those. So specifically, Peter is pointing out the prophecy that there, there would be the betrayal of Judas um, and that his office or his position needed to be filled again. And they did that. We saw that. And they did that because the word of God told them that was what was needed. Then in chapter two, we've got a major event of the sound of rushing wind, what looked like fingers or tongues of fire coming into the room where they were, they were uh, gathered, whether it was just the 11 or whether it was the entire 120. I believe it may have been all of them. I, I honestly don't know for sure, but the tongues rested on each one of them. And as a result, um, what they were filled with the Holy Spirit and what did they do? Each man spoke, they all spoke in languages mm -hmm. um, where they that were that people in normal languages people could rec recognize. Known languages, sometimes that's how we call it. Known languages that people could recognize, like you're saying. And this gathered a crowd. There, there was already a crowd in Jerusalem. It's a crowded place, but this gathered a crowd, whether it was the sound of the rushing wind or whether it was them speaking in tongues, it seems like it was both. And um, people marveled at this. But some people said they must be drunk. And then you've got Peter again referencing the Old Testament, the, the book of Joel. And in it, he's giving an, a reason for what's going on. Um, telling them that no, they're not drunk. This was prophesied before, but he also adds in in verse 21 of chapter two that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a very important phrase because um, so far we haven't seen people necessarily doing that. Then he turns and he addresses the people and he tells them who Jesus was and what they did, referencing Old Testament throughout. Um, basically one of the main references is to David and in referencing David, David had prophesied about the Messiah, but maybe they didn't know that David wasn't prophesying about himself, but he's putting side by side, David and Jesus and saying, um, G David is still in the tomb. Jesus rose from the dead. Resurrection is huge, people. Resurrection is huge. A big difference here. Not dissing David, obviously, because he is an amazing um, example to them and an amazing um, uh, father, you know, as far as their elder, uh, ancestors are concerned. And all of the things that were said and promised to David, which there would be a descendant on his throne and, um, so, and then coming forward. So then we see many people coming to belief, many more people added to their numbers. And again, a lot of times people will look at these numbers and they don't see them as 5,000 or what is it? 3,000 3, more people. They're saying 3,000 total. Honestly, I don't really care if it's 3,120. 3, it's a lot of people. Um, and more are coming. And then it talks about how they lived during that time. Now, the next thing you see in chapter three, that's our review of chapter two and one, and now in chapter three, this is the stuff we need to talk about today. We're gonna to look at it in uh, paragraphs again. I don't know if you can read that, but that's three verses one to six, seven to 10, 11 to 26, and then we'll get into four. Um, and again, we've got to be brief so that we can move forward because we want to see what happened and then we want to talk about why this is important, right? Okay, so in chapter three, verses one to six, what's going on? The, the man was healed. All right, where? Um, at the temple at the beautiful gate. Okay, you saw the um, diagram that was given to you of the temple, Jerusalem and the temple itself. 
the beautiful gate would have been the main entrance in. Um, and so this man, we find out later, is like 40 years old, and he has been lame his whole life, right? From his mother's womb. So if he's there, then he's probably there a lot, and somebody's got to get him there. Probably. He can't probably get there on his own. What's he there for? Money. Okay. Money. He's better right? He's begging. He, he's so poor and so incapable of, because of his lameness that he can't provide for himself. He depends on these alms, these charitable contributions. So who walks past him? Peter and John. Peter and John. Why were they there? It's the hour of prayer. Okay, it says the ninth hour. Generally speaking, when we see biblical references like that, six o'clock is the beginning of the day. The, the first hour would be then. So the ninth hour would be about three o'clock in the afternoon. Apparently this was the hour of prayer, a time set aside that they would have known that at the temple people are gonna be praying, right? And that's where they went. This would have been a normal part of their life if they were in Jerusalem, okay? So as they're normally going about their life and as they normally walk in this way, they see this man and they may have seen him before, okay? But what does this man ask of them? Money, he asks for money. Money. Right, so he does ask for it, right? Um, <laughs> Y'all know the song? Yeah. Peter and John went to pray. <laughs> they met a lame man on the way. They asked, he asked for alms and they held out their palms. He held out his palms. And this is what Peter did say. <laughs> Silver and gold have I none. <laughs> but, but such as I have, you may, I may give. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There you go. So I can sing better than me. Thank you. <laughs> Hard to sing it. Um, all right, so that's Peter's response. Peter says, I don't have silver and gold. I can't give you that, but I can give you what I do have. What I do have is in the name of Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. Now, I'm, I'm looking down because I want to make sure that I read how he's referred to because sometimes it's interesting to see these names, the, the way Jesus is referred to, and even this week, we went through how is Jesus referred to? You know, how, what does, what, and that was really in Peter's um, sermon later, or his message later, but Jesus Christ, Jesus is his name, the name given, Yeshua. Yeshua is, means, is, is, does that sound like Joshua? Yeshua? Yeshua sounds like Joshua. Joshua means savior. It means it's if you look at the the name, um, and I say Yeshua because it's the J would be a Y, um, and that would be in the Hebrew. Christ is the Greek version of Messiah, which is the Hebrew word, and the Nazarene is telling what area he came from, and it's just interesting that they say it that way. Um, and Peter then sees this man by his right hand, raises his up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. Just for a second, think about that. First time in this man's life, he stands up. Now, Ashley's got a little, little one that's not even walking yet, I don't think, right? And you, mm -hmm. you know, y'all know about what watching that process, right? You know, they look like monkeys at first. <laughs> and then as we get older, we go back to looking like monkeys. <laughs> um, balance would be an issue. Up being standing upright, his body wouldn't be used to that. And yet, immediately, just by Peter saying it and Peter bringing him to his feet. Now, in this moment, what did the man have to do? He had to have faith enough to believe. Yeah. Right? Because have you ever been sitting on the ground and somebody tried to pull you up and you didn't want them to? 
Yeah. You can resist it, right? You can resist it. And so, but he didn't. He literally accepted it in the sense of receiving it and standing up. This is a picture, just for a second. This is a picture of salvation. Everything pertaining to life and godliness is given to us, is provided in advance in the name of Jesus. And all we have to do is stand up, is accept it, receive it. And as um, I think it was Diane was saying, is um, say, you know, to believe it. And, and that's even mentioned later. So he, now he didn't just stand up. What does he do? He leaps, jumps, <laughs> and leaps. Okay, what's the rest of the song? He was walking, he walking and leaping and praising God. God. Walking and leaping and praising God. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So he the Nazareth parts in there. Um, okay, and then they were taking note of him being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. That's what's going on in, sorry, I went on to three verse 10, but you've got Peter and John. They go to the temple in verses one to six, and Peter, I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna write it all. But Peter and John go to the temple, and in the name of Jesus, they say to this man, "I'll give you what I have." Then, in verses seven to ten, the man is healed. And the people are amazed. This isn't fake, folks. There are a lot of, you know, people out, charlatans out there that have people staged and set up. This is not fake. People have been seeing this man from birth. Okay. And then um, it says in verse, we're looking at 11 through 26. So 11 through the rest of the chapter, you've got this man clinging to Peter and John and all the people ran together to, it says the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. And when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, men of Israel. What is Peter starting to do? Preach. Very good. So you've got Peter. And I'm just going to say message. You can call it preaching. You can call it whatever you want. The word preach, by the way, in the New Testament is the word evangelize. So a lot of times we use the word preach for anything that the pastor does from the pulpit, or even we'll say preacher, right? The word preach is very specific to evangelism. So not that I'm not faulting our terminology, just saying, just I like specifics and I like the language and all that, but you've got people amazed and they're gathered. This is a huge thing and they're at the temple already. Um, so there's going to be a gathering there and there, there's a gathering there because it's the time for prayer. Think this is all a coincidence? <laughs> I don't believe in coincidences, right? And Peter, yes, the answer is Peter begins to give a message. Peter begins to preach, however you want to write that. But what is he taking? I mean, do you see that he's taking advantage? He's taking an opportunity, okay? Does that speak to you in any way? Mm. Is there anything that we should be doing? Mm. I mean, over and over, we wanna to get to application. You know, when you see these patterns, and we're beginning to see a pattern here, right? There's a gathering in chapter two. Peter answers a question starting out, but then Peter starts giving a message to the people that are there. Same here, right? I don't think Peter and John went to the temple to heal this man. God gave them the opportunity to heal this man, and they did. And I mean, and God healed him through Peter's words and this man's faith. And then Peter uses the opportunity that's given. Okay, 
This message has some similarities to the prior one, but we want to look at it also in verses 12 through 26. You've got Peter saying, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety, we made him walk? He says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. The one whom you delivered up and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. And, but you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Now, these are very recent events. This is something that happened maybe two months prior, about two months prior. And these might have been the same. Well, these would have been some of the same people that were gathered in Jerusalem because this is right after the Pentecost. And they probably would have stayed between or these are the residents of Jerusalem. So these are the literal people beyond the 3000 that have gotten saved already. These are more. And he says, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. Back to what he told them in Acts chapter one, be witnesses of what? The resurrection. The resurrection. And he just said a fact, which is God raised him from the dead. Okay. It, it kind of goes down to this. If you can hold on to this one thing, if we are witnesses to his resurrection, we are witnesses also to his birth, which was miraculous, to his life and all of the fulfillment in all of that, his death on the cross, which is extremely important for our sins, his burial, meaning it literally was dead, he was literally dead, and his resurrection, which proved God was satisfied with what Jesus did. And he just boils it down to the one thing, resurrection, because all of that is important <laughs> to that resurrection and everything after it is important. That's what we're to be witnesses to. That's what they were to be witnesses to. I guess I should ask, is that what we're supposed to be witnesses to? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. So is it important for us to read these words and really get steeped in why this is important? Yes. Yes, absolutely. 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 Okay. So here's where Peter says in verse 16, on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus, which has strengthened this man whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through Jesus, through him, has, has given him, the man that was healed, this perfect health in the presence of you all. Okay, that's not what it says back when he's healed, but when Peter says in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. What I give, I give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Like I said, the man had to act on that. Even though Peter reached down and pulled him up, the man had to stand. Mm -hmm. He had to believe it and stand. And Peter is saying what he, what his faith is based on is the name of Jesus. What is what his faith is, how he was strengthened was through that faith that comes through Jesus. The faith was not in the man. The faith was not in the man. The faith as well as the healing was given to him. We all know the verses. We are saved by grace through faith. It Amen. is the gift of God, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. When it says it, you have to think pronoun, pre, press it, pre, sorry, what is the, um, pre, the, what is the pre for the pronoun? <laughs> I'm trying, what is the, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, what you're, what the pronoun is pointing back to, whatever that word is, um, you have to look at that sentence and say, we are saved by grace through faith, it, it is not pointing back to grace because it says it is the gift of God. Gift of God is the definition of grace. So we wouldn't say grace is the gift of God because it's saying the same thing. The it is pointing back to faith. We're saved by grace, the gift of God, through faith, which is a gift of God. We don't have it in us. 
not of ourselves so that no man right. can boast. That's right. 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 The faith is not of ourselves. The salvation is not of ourselves. None of it is of us, except for there's that moment, that manward part where we have to accept it. We have to receive it. We have to take a step, take an action on it. And that's what this man pictures here. It's just incredible. Okay. So Peter goes on and he says, um, I know that you, okay, and now brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ should suffer, has he, he has thus fulfilled, Jesus has fulfilled the suffering that was prophesied all those times ago. So even though he's saying you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did, he's also saying you really don't have an excuse. because it was told beforehand and Jesus has fulfilled it. Now, just for a second, all of this that Peter is saying, there's, there's a lot packed in here. He is saying the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and our fathers, in other words, all those men standing there would say our God, not just some nebulous God, our God um, that spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their fathers that God glorified his servant, Jesus. Okay. You looked up the verse this week in Isaiah. Who does God share his glory with? No one. No one. So why, why would Peter say here he glorified, meaning he shared his glory with Jesus? What's Peter telling him? Is there, they're, they're, they're one. They're one. They're one. Jesus and God. Absolutely. Very important point. And it's subtle, but it's there. Um, I always love to find those proofs. And then he says, you disown the holy and righteous one. Every person there, they're starting to think, oh my goodness, I know where that is. I've heard that before. These are prophecies. You looked them up this week, holy and righteous one. And then he said, you put to death the prince of life. Look at the contrast there. It's incredible. Why would he call him the Prince of Life? What'd you find this week? Um, Who was that creation? Jesus. The triune God was the creation. Genesis 1 26 says us, we, um, referencing, if you go back to Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God. That's what our translation says. If you look it up, it's Elohim, which is it's the plural ending for El, um, Elohim. And then in Genesis 1, 26, it references we, us, made in our image. Um, let us make man in our image by our likeness. And it also talks about the spirit hovering over the surface of the waters. And then when you get into the New Testament, it's not the only place, but when you get in the New Testament over and over, it talks about, well, in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things came to be because of Jesus. Over and over and over, Paul writes about that. So he is the Prince of Life. It's because of him we have life. He brought it into being. And on the basis of faith, this man was healed. And then it says, goes on and it says, repent therefore and return that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Over and over and over, the mouth of the prophets, the mouth of the prophets, the prophets announced, the prophets said, the word of God through these prophets. Now, there's a lot there. Did y'all understand all those time references? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I think so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, you just kind of have to stop sometimes and kind of look at them. Then he starts referencing, and this is one of our Bible references. This is Moses talking. What did Moses say of Jesus? And we find it in Deuteronomy. Moses 
Moses calls Jesus what? Prophet. Right. And he says, a prophet like me, talking about Moses, a prophet like me from among the brethren or countrymen is what, if you looked in Deuteronomy, it says, and you shall give him heed in everything he says to you. Okay. Did they? No. No. <laughs> So again, there's a lot of rebuking in here. I mean, he's, he's referencing and pointing back to who Jesus is that if when you, we read through this, we know these things. We've got to remember he's talking to a group of people that didn't believe this about Jesus, um, but they knew the scriptures. And so Moses had um, said, there will be a prophet. God will raise up a prophet like me from the brethren and you're to give him heed to everything he says. When you went back to Deuteronomy and looked up the references, it also says, God says to them, if you don't, you're going to answer to me. Did you catch that? What, what's going on right now? Do you think the people of that day that watched Jesus, listened to Jesus, and actually participated in crucifying Jesus, do you think they answered to God for not listening to him? Mm -hmm. Well, they either repented or they yeah. answered for it, right? Is that true today? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what emphasis does that give you on the message that we're to be telling people? Does that give you any mm -hmm. emphasis? Okay. I hope so. Mm-hmm. Does me okay? It also go ahead. Also because of the ignorance, it, it um, in other words, nobody. Even if you haven't heard, I mean, some of these people, some of these people would have been taught, you know, from the temple and from from a, from listening to the scriptures. But it also he references in there that you don't. You're in other words, nobody is without excuse. So like today, if we can talk to anybody, just whether whether they've heard of Jesus Christ or not. We can talk to anyone whether they know anything about Christ. He's making that kind of clear in this message. I agree with you. And Romans is very clear. You know, whether yeah. you're talking about Jew or Gentile, they're without excuse. And so we also, though, have a huge responsibility that we are very much without re excuse for giving them the message. How mm -hmm. are they going to hear if somebody's not sent? You know, how are they going to? It's a. Yeah, and then we have to say the words. Um, I forgot the actual reference there, sorry. Um, and then it goes on and it says, all prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors on um, also announced these days. So literally every prophet is what he's saying. Every prophet talked about this in some form, in some way. If you're the sons of the prophets and the covenant which God made with our father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is another reference, and this is from Genesis 22. And that's given to Abraham when Abraham was called. And he says, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, if we read that back then, we may think he was talking about Isaac or Jacob um, or the 12 tribes, which it's from that that Jesus came. But he specifically in the New Testament tells us that the seed here was singular and it's talking about Jesus. And so in Jesus, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Um, and then it says, for you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. When, when God sent Jesus, it was to the Jews first. So he's specifically talking to that group of people. And there's so much in here. And when we, if you try sometime to put on your Jews, Jewish hat or your thinking as if you were Jewish and understand what it would mean to sit there and listen to this in that time, in that moment, and, and hear this message. Now, he moves on and we're going into verse, uh, this is Peter's message, and it references so many things um, that you can, you can write any of them on there. 
Um, but that was the message. And then in verse, I'm sorry, chapter four, verses one through four, what is going on right now? What happens as a result of this all happening? The temple people didn't want him. They didn't want him talking about him. Mm -hmm. Right. They were greatly disturbed, right? Mm -hmm. I like the phrase, temple people. <laughs> <laughs> They are greatly disturbed. And it, it specifically names the temple guard, the people, even just the people that were there, the Sadducees um, and the priests. These are just be people that would have been at the temple in that, that context, in that exact place. Um, and they were disturbed because of two things. What were they disturbed that they heard in this message? resurrection right they were teaching about the resurrection and they were just teaching jesus right okay now um so they were they were disturbed because they were proclaiming they were teaching the people and proclaiming in jesus the resurrection from the dead um the group called the sadducees does anybody know why that is significant with that particular group they were sad because they didn't believe in the resurrection, so they were sad, you see. <laughs> yeah, they did not believe in the resurrection. That's how we remember it. But they're sad, you see. <laughs> um, but so they would have been disturbed that this group of people that Peter and John were teaching about the resurrection. They definitely would have been. And so then in verses 5 to 12, they, they have them um, held, um, making them stop. And the next day, because it was evening, they, uh, wait a minute, uh, those who heard the message, many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about how many? 5,000. Wow. Yeah. So now we've got this number. 5,000 believed. So again, whether this is 5,000 more or if 5,000 total, it doesn't really matter. It's a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people believed as a result of this. So each time you see this pattern, you see a gathering that God made happen and Peter boldly speaking and, and proclaiming using Old Testament references because that's what they would have understand and bringing the Old Testament up to the fulfillment that Jesus gave. And as a result, and in there, he always throws in repent. He always has that in there and people hear it and some believe and people are added to their numbers. Here's a pattern. Now we're not always about, it has to be a certain way, but we got, if we can start seeing some patterns, then we can start seeing some things that maybe we need to apply in our own lives. Okay. So in five to 12, you've got the next day, you've got this group. We're just going to call them the council because it's an easier way of referring to them. Um, but it includes rulers, elders, scribes, Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, who was also a high priest. I think uh, Annas was Caiaphas's father or vice versa. Um, and John and Alexander, and we don't know who they are except for we're told they're all of high priestly descent. Um, remember, the high priests all came from Aaron out of the tribe of Levi. And then it says, when they placed them in the center, so... I guess they're surrounding them. They place them in the center, um, which would be who? It would be Peter and John and maybe this lame man also. Okay. So what would you call this? What would you say is going on here? You'd say they're, they basically been arrested and they're on trial, they're on trial, right? Okay. And when they placed them in the center, they asked this very important question. What was it? By what power? By what power? In what name? In what name? Or in what name? <clears throat> have you done this? Are they asking them, had they done this? No, they're acknowledging that this happened. They're just saying, by what power or about in what name have you done this? 
What does this provide Peter and John with? The opportunity. A gospel, <laughs> a gospel opportunity. There you go. An, a gospel <laughs> opportunity. An opportunity to witness. Here we go. Something that Jesus told them, right? Jesus told them before he died, don't worry. When you have, when, when you're called before men, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance the things that you would need to say. So Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit and begins to address them, right? Mm -hmm. In that, he says, if we're on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands before you in good health. Pretty succinct, not like Peter. <laughs> He gets it down a little bit, but he says, by, I mean, they, they literally hand him this platter and he gets to say, oh, great question. The answer is, if, if you're asking about how we did this, how this man is healed, let me tell you, by the name of Jesus. And it answers the question about what power, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um. Then he quotes scripture. He says, he, Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which came, became the very cornerstone. Okay, that's a reference to Psalm 118. And if you went to look it up this week, again, he, he's quoting scripture to them. They would know this scripture and he's, it's like he's tying up these nice little bows for him and, and bringing forward and pointing to Jesus and saying, Jesus, whom you crucified, but God raised him from the dead. What did they just witness to? The resurrection. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, he became the very, or chief, as in other translations, cornerstone. What's the significance of a cornerstone? It's a place Bill. Foundation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. When the cornerstone of a foundation is set, everything else is based on it. Lined on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Everything else, yes, is squared up and based on it. It is, it's the first and most important establishment of the foundation and then the building. He became that. This, this stone that you didn't want, the stone that you rejected, God made the cornerstone. Very significant. And then he says, there's no salvation. There is salvation, sorry. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Now, if you recall back in chapter two, when Peter spoke to that first, that first time to that group of people, their response was it pierced them in their hearts, right? I want you to see this does not pierce them in their hearts. There's no reference to that here, right? Doesn't impact them that way. Um, but what do they, what is their response? Um, are you referencing when they recognized that they were uneducated, but that they had been with Jesus? All right. Yeah. yeah. In uh, verse 13, they said they understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, but they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Yes. And they, uh, they observed the confidence and they were amazed because these are uneducated men. Now you think about that. This group that's surrounding them are all extremely educated. They have position, they have power, they have the word of God, they're extremely educated. And in contrast, you've got these two normal, common fishermen who do not have education. Now they would have been raised uh, as Jewish boys, you know, they would have understood the basics, 
but they didn't have, let's say, a high school education or a college degree or steeped in the law. And they even called them lawyers, not the way we call lawyers, but the law of God. Um, and these are speaking with God. And, and they understood they were untrained men. So, and then they saw the man who'd been healed standing with them and they had nothing to stay, say in reply. Mm -hmm. There's just nothing. What can we say? So what did they do? What's the next step? The council did what? They ordered them to leave. Right. So that and they conferred talk with together. One another. Right. So they mm -hmm. could talk together. Um, and then they said, what do we do? Right. Right. For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. They're not denying the miracle. They're noting it. And they know that everyone that watched it, it's like it's known all over Jerusalem at this point. So they're going, okay, we've got a miracle. It happened through these men. So what do we do about this? What's their answer? What did they decide? To tell them not to talk about it anymore. Right. right. Threatened them. Threatened them. Right. So this is 13 to 22. So the council threatened them. I mean, there's obviously a whole lot more in here, but the council threatened them. Peter gave a great response. They saw the confidence of Peter and John. So they conferred together and they said, okay, we're just going to tell them to stop doing this. We're going to tell them to stop speaking anymore in this man's name or teach it all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and, and then when they brought Peter and John in and they told him that Peter and John, Peter and John answered what, what was their answer? They, they asked them, do you think it's right that I would listen to you rather than to God? Okay. And then what is their conclusion? They cannot stop speaking about what they have seen and heard. Right. AKA God wins. <laughs> right. God wins. Right. They can't stop speaking. Okay. But they didn't just say, okay, okay, and leave and go do it anyway. Mm -hmm. They spoke up right then and said, you judge between this, you know, they're, they're kind of acknowledging, can you imagine two uneducated or any of us, can you imagine any of us standing before whoever you want to put in that circle of men, and in this case, just men, um, that you would see as having great knowledge of God, having lots of degrees and lots of letters past their name and you've got a whole group of them and here you are you know just somebody who studies the bible goes to church regular person and they're being told to do something that it's burning within them they can't not do because who gave them the order to do what they're doing jesus jesus mm -hmm. Right. So they're saying we can't stop. We can't stop speaking what we've seen and heard. That's the very definition of that W word, which is witness. witness. They're basically saying we can't stop being a witness. We're going to keep doing it. So they leave and says, and they threaten them further and they let them go finding no basis on which they might punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened. For the man was more than 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So they didn't not do anything. The council didn't not do anything because they didn't have it within their power to do something. What did this same group of people done just 50 days or more prior? They crucified Jesus, right? They have a lot of ability within them. So Peter and John, just put yourself in a moment. This is the group of men that made the decision about Jesus and, and stirred up the crowd. And they're standing in front of them. 
their lives were literally in these men's hands. So think about that when you think about what Peter and John said. Don't put, as I always say, don't put a Hollywood slant on this and give to Peter and John attitude because they really were respectful. They were extremely respectful of this group of men. But they well, and I always think too, like just because we know the end of the story, at least in this moment, like not the ultimate end for them, but like the end of their story doesn't mean that they did in the moment. You know, right. so they didn't know that they were going to be okay and they still said it. Obviously, we knew that they were going to be released, but right. I don't know. I would have been so bold <laughs> if I didn't know the end of the story. And that's that's definitely part of the application is we've got to try to put ourselves in that moment and think about what it would be like for this because it's real easy to read these verses and go, yay, Peter and John, that's great. I'm so proud of you. Similarly, you've got the three um, friends of Daniel standing outside the fiery furnace when they're told by Nebuchadnezzar, when the music plays, you have to bow down to the statue of me, and the three didn't, and they're brought forward, Chad, Rack, Chad, Rack, Chuck, and Benny, if you've ever seen the VeggieTales version, um, and Peter, I mean, those three look at Nebuchadnezzar and say almost exactly these same words. Said, whether or not God delivers us, I don't know, but no matter what, I'm not bowing down to your idol. Mm -hmm. Peter and John basically are faced with a fiery furnace type situation and they say you judge between whether we should listen to you or whether we should listen to God because remember Peter had just said that Moses had said that the prophet that God was going to raise up later they were supposed to heed that prophet that prophet is Jesus they're choosing to heed that prophet Jesus told Peter and John specifically, and others, be my witness. They're taking that seriously. <clears throat> and they're doing it in front of us, in front of this group of people. And then it goes on, and we've got a few more minutes to finish 23 through 31. Um, they were released. They went back to their companions. And what is happening in this next bit when their companions, which would include that 120, I don't know how many you would include, it might include the 5,000. Um, they go back to them and they tell them, what is the first response of this group of people? To pray. Mm -hmm. Pray. Right. I love, it is pray and specifically cry out to God, right? Lift their voices and cry out to God. Um, and one accord. I always mm -hmm. amazed. Mm -hmm. And, and we saw in verse in chapter one of Acts, when they were together, they were of one accord and of one mind, and they were praying. You see this pattern. This should be our first response, mm -hmm. right? They cry out to God, and then what is their what are the first words out of their mouths? Just characterize them. What what are they saying in these first words out of their mouths? They're glorifying God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're glorifying God. God. They're calling yeah. him who he is. Yeah. That, that's, the, that's what glory means, by the way. Glory means to give an exact estimation of who God is. And I always, I always, sorry, I always found that like, um, it is you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Such an interesting con contrast to when, um, jo and Job, when he was starting to question God and kind of wavering and God was like, where were you? He basically said, where were you and all those things happened. Um, so I think that they were at least wise enough not to pull one of those. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you go back through scripture and you just study prayer, like, and I mean, study people praying, one of the first things every time is usually based on their circumstances, they give that right estimation of God. They call out who he is. Um, as Sophie is saying, you know, Job, the response of God is like, where were you when I was laying the foundations of the earth? Because Job was questioning God. But when you look at um, King Hezekiah, when he's got an enemy outside the gates, he goes and he writes out his prayer and he puts it down on the altar and he's praying back and he starts with who God is. When Jesus gave us what we call the Lord's prayer, but it's really the our prayer given by the Lord, he starts out with our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, right? He recognizes, starts out, do you see a pattern? Mm -hmm. Whenever we're praying, we need to start with 
who God is. Speaking of which, I didn't start us in prayer. I'm sorry. Uh, bad, bad on me. Um, and in this case, it's God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. I just did a short study of Jonah recently. Jonah on the boat. Jonah running from God. Jonah called out and they're saying like, who are you? Why is the lot cast in your name coming up? And he said, I am a follower of God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea. The sea, by the way, that he's really disturbed with right now. Um, and then he says, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage? Does this seem weird that this is sitting here? Why did the Gentiles rage and the people devised futile t things and the kings of the earth took their stand? And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his, against his Christ. I mean, when you first read it, it kind of is jarring. It's like, well, why are they saying that? And then you go, they've just taken Psalm 2 and they've seen it as right now. They're right now. They're seeing mm -hmm. it as they're right now. The Gentiles, the Romans, the peoples, the Israelites, they're in Jerusalem, the kings of the earth, the um, rulers who were gathered together, this group of people that were just against Peter and John, and they're, but ultimately they're against God and they're against his anointed, his Christ, his Messiah. And it says, for truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. So that's the explanation of why they're talking about Psalm 2. i got to put Psalm 2 up here. And this would have been in their minds, and of one accord they're saying this, and it says, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. It's always interesting, and this is the second place we've seen, that at least second place that we've seen in Acts, where the reference is back to what has happened, all of these events that have happened, God had a purpose and he predestined them to happen. Yet, the people that made them happen, that's the Godward part, the manward part is, are responsible for what they did. That's the, the manward part. And then it says, and now, Lord, this is now their request. They've acknowledged him for who he is. They've told him what their circumstances is, is at the time. And then they've said, um, take note of their threats and grant your bond servants that may speak your word with all confidence. Is that what you would have asked in that moment? Mm -mm. <laughs> That's not what I would have asked. <laughs> they asked for... So they, okay, so what I've got written here is in their prayer, they recognize God for who he is. They recognize their situation, even quoting scripture. And now they've asked, this is their request. They've asked that God take note and God give them boldness, right? Or confidence. Um, and then he says, while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Okay, have those things happened? Has somebody been healed? Yes. Have signs and wonders happened? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they have happened, but they're also talking about now. Now. Let us be bold. Let us have confidence while these things are happening. So they're expecting more. They're expecting them to continue. And it says, um, and when they prayed, what was the result? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yes. The place was shaken and they were filled. So the place was shaken. That would be kind of noticeable. <laughs> and that would be God showing up, right? And they were filled with the Spirit, and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. What did they just ask for? Boldness. Yeah. They asked for the confidence or boldness to speak, and immediately they began to speak with boldness. 
It's incredible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Do we expect things to happen like that? Kind of convicting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be kind of nice every now and then for the building to shake. Yeah. <laughs> Just to say, gotcha. <laughs> but if you had a whole bunch of people, like 5,000, let's say, in a building, and all of them were filled with Holy Spirit at the same time, and there was boldness, that alone would shake the building. <laughs> right? Resonant frequency. Okay. Well, we have covered what we needed to cover. We're at the 102 point. If people need to drop out, that's fine. Um, we, um, I want, though, for us to remember the basic two ba big concepts or themes in this part that we just looked at are the power is in the name of Jesus and that we are to have confidence and boldness to be his witnesses. So take that through your week and see how God's going to use it because he will and throughout the rest of your life and just recognize we're no different than them in the sense that we too have the filling of the Holy Spirit. We too may not ever feel that we're in a situation where our life is threatened. Do you realize how convicting that part is? Peter and John's life was literally at risk and they spoke with respect, but with boldness because you can do both, and they would not bow to the altar, bow to the idol, would not cave, whichever way, you know, they, they face the fiery furnace, however you want to look at it, and they still spoke with boldness, and in this particular situation, they walked away. Take note, it doesn't always end this way, but in this particular situation, they were released and the council didn't feel like they could do anything basically because they knew the people knew and they would have to account to the people and the people wouldn't like it. And so that's in its of itself a witness as well. So we're going to end, I'll end in prayer since I didn't in prayer. Sorry about that. And then we'll take a brief break and we'll come back for the video. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you that you have shown up. We praise you that we are part of what is also true for these. We too, Father, I too, ask for boldness and confidence to speak in those situations, to have that awareness all the time, to wake each day and ask for well, when it is and what it is you would want me to do, what next? And that I would boldly and confidently, not with arrogance, but with your boldness and your confidence, that I would speak your truth. We know, Father, that we have all these things that these men were speaking, as far as the Old Testament references, as far as the proof and the assurance of who Jesus is, and that is what we are to witness to, who he is, especially the part about his resurrection. That's the part that gives us the hope that we have and the hope for others. And if we have this, just like Peter and John said that to the man that day, what I have, I can give to you. I can't give what I don't have. What I have, I can give to you. And we have the power of the resurrection within us. We have the name of Jesus that we can speak in. We have the authority and the power that's behind that. And we need you to show us and guide us in how we're to, when we are, and how we're to do right by that. We ask that you take us through the lecture with Kay and just have us understand the things that we should. Bring us back next week, Kevin done our work so that we're prepared and we ask for it all in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.